Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your marriage without your husband's conscious effort so that you feel desired and taken care of and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm talking about three secrets you need to know if your marriage is unhappy. My guest Sage had mistakenly married an extremely broken, immature, ignorant man who was ruining her life with his narcissistic tendencies. He had anger issues and he told her he was in no way attracted to her. But Sage made a decision and followed it up with action that changed everything about her marriage and her family and her world. Today, she says she couldn't be more happy with the road she and her husband are walking down. And she's going to explain what happened and how she transformed her marriage so you can do the same thing. The Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award goes to a blog about who gets the short end of the stick in marriage, and it sure is a doozy. All that is coming up, but first, I'm going to reveal three secrets you need to know if your marriage is unhappy. Are you stuck in an unhappy marriage but maybe can't leave? Maybe you're in an unhappy marriage with kids, for example, and you really don't want to see your family torn apart. So you grin, at least sometimes, and you bear it. But at what cost? It's so painful to endure it all, right? The frustration of not being able to communicate with the person you love, the overwhelm, the resentment at not getting the support you need, and the loneliness at night. If you've experienced this condition, I bet you could write the Cosmo version of the unhappy marriage quiz yourself. Well, I have good news and I have bad news. So let's start with the bad news. If you're wondering how to get out of an unhappy marriage or, or how to survive a loveless, sexless marriage, then here's the bad news. This is not the podcast for you. The good news is that if you want to stay married, you can turn things around to create the vibrant, happy marriage you deserve. Here are the secrets to creating a lifelong romance so you can have the happy marriage you had in mind when you said, I do. Number one, know what you want. You got to have a vision. When you're stuck in a miserable relationship, it's natural to put out feelers and look to him for the vital information about whether there should be any hope. What are his intentions for the marriage? Is he willing to do the work to make things better? Is he ready to make a change? Yeah, it takes two to make a marriage work, of course. The problem is in looking over on his paper, just like the school teacher told us not to do, many women overlook the most important information for this equation, which is what do you want? What do you want? If you had a magic wand and you could wave it, what is it that you see for yourself? What would you create? Maybe right now it's just peace, just an end to the fighting or the cold war. Maybe it's to get back the playfulness and the passion that you once had or never had in the first place. Or maybe it's to raise your children in a happy, loving household with their father and modeling the kind of relationship you'd want them to have in the future. Whatever your vision is, the reason it's so vital is that you are the keeper of your marriage as the wife. You have enormous power to create the kind of culture you want in your relationship, even if that feels like the furthest thing from your reality right now. Now, exhibit A is Tara, who Looking back at the bad old days in her marriage, described them as a decade of misery. Things were fine until she got pregnant with their first child and her husband went to a poker night. He became obsessed with poker, reading books about poker and playing at all hours, including throughout the entire six weeks of his paternity leave. He was supposed to be taking care of their new baby. And Tara says he was totally tuned out. They never spent time together and he wouldn't even come to bed with her. She felt like poker was his mistress and she became resentful at the lack of attention. She tried to nag and drag him, but it wasn't working. So she knew she needed a different approach. She decided to refocus her view with gratitude. Every time she felt the urge to control what he was doing, to tell him to stop playing poker, she would express gratitude for something instead, anything, 
Today, he hardly plays poker at all. True story. Instead, he has planned all sorts of trips for them to take together, trips for the family. And sure enough, she had the power to create the culture that she wanted in her relationship once she got in touch with what that was. Now it's your turn. So get out your magic wand and go crazy. Just imagine what might be possible for you if you had the skills to create it. If fear wears its nasty little head saying, well, that's never going to happen for you, then just squash it on the head for now. You can always pick your fear back up later if you want, but it's just, it's not useful for this exercise. Visualize exactly what kind of culture you want in your marriage. Have you got your vision? Okay. Now, number two, love him flaws and all. Now, another thing Tara wanted to create in her marriage was mutual respect. She didn't feel too respected when her husband was out all hours doing his thing. And then she got the skills to do just that. And it was, you guessed it, it was respect. She couldn't make him respect her, but she could explore how she might deepen her own practice of the skill of respect. And that meant expecting the best outcome from her husband, even when it looked like he must have an addiction. It meant relinquishing control of what her husband was doing and letting go of trying to solve his problems. It meant giving him the space to be his own man. It meant not taking the bait when an argument was brewing. These days, he's so respectful of Tara and so keen to please her that he has a cute habit of making lists just to show her he's checking things off. All right. Secret number three is get some supportive confidants. It's bad enough to feel alone in your own marriage, but not being able to share what you're going through intensifies the loneliness until it can be unbearable. When your marriage is in crisis, that's when you need to be heard and supported even more. It's natural to Turn to those closest to you to fulfill those needs, or at least to vent, right? But the problem with that is it often creates a whole new issue that makes the situation even worse. Family and friends just want the best for you. And with their protective instincts coming out, it can sound like this, you deserve better, or it'll never work if he doesn't change, or you need to leave him right? It's hard enough to keep the faith to save a marriage without such hopeless voices in your head clashing with your own intentions for your relationship. And even after you hone the tools to get your miracle, those loved ones will be hard pressed to ever forgive the man who wronged you. There are lots of well-intentioned advocates for divorce out there, which is why it's so important to confide in people genuinely rooting for you and for your husband. Ideally, other women who have been where you are and have transformed it themselves. There's immense relief just in knowing that you're not alone and you're not crazy for wanting to stay married even when things look really dark. Families depend on strong, lasting marriages. And I can't think of anything more important than fighting for yours. If you'd like to be my guest on the Empowered Wife podcast and share about how you fixed a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. My guest Sage had mistakenly married an extremely broken, immature, ignorant man who was ruining her life with his narcissistic tendencies. He had anger issues and told her he was in no way attracted to her. And they fought incessantly about how to raise their son. But Sage made a decision and followed it up with action that changed everything about her marriage, her family, and her world. And today she says she couldn't be more happy with the road she and her husband are walking down. She's going to explain what happened and how she transformed her marriage 
so you can do the same thing. Sage, welcome to the Empowered Life podcast. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Laura. I'm so glad to be here. Take us back to the beginning. What were things like in the bad old days? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you say, said beginning because um, it really started from the very first walk we took. The bad old days started at the very beginning. Um, and I'm just going to have to pick my stories here because you name it and I tried to control it. You name it and we had an issue with it. So it was it was so bad. Um, and just as a setup for why I think uh, one of the reasons it was so bad is um, to say that we um, basically, for lack of a better way of saying it, we married for religious reasons. So um, both of us are kind of extreme people and um, we are both really serious about our um, following Jesus. And so when we, when we got to know each other, my husband was in seminary to become a priest, to discern um, becoming a priest. And I um, was also contemplating a single life. That was something I was interested in as a way of um, just as a different way of living my life and serving God and others. So um, anyway, it's a little crazy, but um, when we started to get to know each other, um, I, I guess I had never met a man who um, who we, I enjoyed, basically enjoyed, and who shared these um, similar values and um, a similar or shared vision. So um, I say that to say we were drawn to each other and we, we enjoyed each other more or less. But um, I was not in love with my husband when I got married to him. And I don't think he would say he was in love with me either. We, we loved each other. We were good and honest friends, but um, we married, like we kind of based this life altering decision on um, like this conviction about, about marriage and what real love was. And so anyway, um, <clears throat> that's the setup. <laughs> and, um, so that's, that's what we did. We married really quickly. And then, um, and then, uh, pretty quickly, uh, immediately, immediately I regretted the decision mm. and, um, it was really scary because I thought, uh, wow, you know, God, I wanted to give you my whole life and I thought I could do it in this way. And now, um, it looks like even this gritty, hard kind of love isn't possible for us, much less like romance or something easy, you know? Mm. <laughs> so, and I knew neither of us would divorce. I knew because of our commitments. So uh, I just thought my only option was, you know, this was so conscious, but I thought my only option is to fix this man. Um, so, so it just wasn't enough to have this deepest thing be in sync, but then everything else was just, it, it wasn't working. Um, so we, we came in with just so many differences, um, Laura, like he moved from Germany to, to a tiny little town uh, in Georgia um, in a really tight knit community that I had been a part of for like almost a decade. And um, he, we had different levels of uh, formal education and he came from a farming background in a little village in Germany. Um, I, in my 20s, had really, um, this community, there were many people that I respected. And I kind of had this full-time job of curating an image that would like, um, yeah, that I, I wanted them to affirm me. And so I was really good at that. And I just knew how to read people and say the right things. And um, it, it was exhausting, actually. But um, he <laughs> like a, uh, had a, a full-time job doing the opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he's just this open book, like very honest. Uh, he doesn't pretend he doesn't try to read people. He's just who he is, gives his opinion. And so um, I don't think it's too dramatic to say I, I felt like my identity was like unraveling <laughs> like mm. my. And so because of this person that I was now attached to forever, you know, forever. And so. Um, so anyway, I just became extremely afraid, like everything I was doing was like panic mode. Um, and, you, and, you were afraid, and you were thinking since neither of us will ever get divorced, so I'm going to probably suffer the rest of my life unless I can change him. And that yeah. wasn't working very well. It sounds like anyway. yeah, it didn't, it didn't seem to be working. And yet I wasn't deterred. I was <laughs> okay. Well, sure. Yeah. 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 I, 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 think, <laughs> I, really I didn't even know how to yeah. manipulate it first. It was just outright like control, you know? And, um, <sighs> and so, uh, so what I see now is that the panic and everything, like I had all these, um, what we call negative 
SFPs running constantly. Spouse fulfilling prophecies. The yeah. Spouse, self and spouse fulfilling prophecies just racing through my mind. Um, and we work together. So we were together like all the time. And, and I deal with social anxiety anyway. So, so there are all these, you know, uh, words, these phrases coming through my mind, like, and I didn't know it, but uh, like, he's just not intelligent. He's irrational. He's, he doesn't have any emotional maturity. And then it was like, he's got a mental illness. Like he's pushing yeah. everyone away. Um, and so I think I became hyper vigilant to spot those and like find all the evidence, right. So that I could jump on it and, so, and like save us almost. It was almost like, it sounds so dramatic, but that's how it felt. Um, that I just, uh, had to somehow, uh, find a way to control him so that we wouldn't be rejected by everyone that I wanted to love me. (laughs) So, um, so yeah, um, I had like in social situations, um, and just interrupt me. I I'm just going with it, but I like it. I like it. Okay. Okay. Um, we worked with youth and so I would just that was so hard for me. I had almost like try to get them away from him so that he didn't um, ruin things. And um, I just thought he doesn't understand these kids at all. Um, I would, so he was know, like harsh with, them, harsh with them or um, no, he, he wouldn't be harsh with them. He just um, like, he would um, he's this open book again. So I thought yeah. he shared way too much information with them or um, he just wanted to, like talk theology with him or something. I was just like, this is just out of touch. Like he has no idea, you know? Um, and so this is yeah, not what these like kids that. need. So he was no, he felt like yeah. he wasn't serving those kids. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, and like, if we were going to have a simple dinner with someone, I would prep him before kind of like, Hey, remember this person is like, I don't, I don't even know, but I would prep him. <laughs> and then I would criticize him afterwards and, and show him, how he had pushed that person away. And so it's, I'm embarrassed. I can't believe this, the story, <laughs> like, I can't believe I'm telling this, but, um, but that's what I would do. And okay. These are some things I realized while I was writing this up, Laura, this is so interesting and embarrassing, but um, often in social situations, like if he was going on and on about something and I thought it was bananas and I would just, I, I would look down, like my face is down at my hands and I would get quiet and I would just start sweating like a total physical response at this embarrassment. And, um, and so that's when I was using self-control yeah. <laughs> to not yeah. say anything. Yeah. Um, and then if I felt like I couldn't abide, I couldn't uh, let it just be, he was going on and on or whatever. I would, um, I had this thing, I would like sniff or clear my throat when it was time for him to stop talking. And I mean, just imagine a relationship in which a person is comfortable with that level of control. So it just shows me I was so terrified. Yeah. Um, I was yeah. terrified. You were. So, I mean, and you didn't know anything else, right? I, you didn't see any way that this relationship was going to improve. No. Um, so this is all you had was like yeah. coughing and clearing your throat or whatever. Yeah. yeah. To try yeah. to get just him to, to say, stop. Yeah. We're married, but I am not like him you know, yeah, and, yeah. and I'm more on a team with you people, whoever it, the other person, <laughs> the other was, people so. were. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and he obviously knew that from your body language and, and from your clearing your throat, like, uh, Oh, she oh. approves of me. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Fine. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, but he, he's a pretty strong guy. He would just get through it. You know, he would, he would, um, it's not like that would shut him down, but yeah, he knew, um, I had a tone, and I just thought, well, it's just because you're so extremely sensitive. You can't handle an opinion. Like I have opinions and I don't have a tone. I'm just talking, you know, right. Right. oh dear. So many things. <laughs> and my emotional hangovers, this is all to do with like the social thing. Um, I like after a dinner or a five minute conversation with someone and us, I maybe couldn't sleep that night because I'm worried about what my husband said and how, what that person's thinking of me now. You know, it really was all about me in the end yeah, and sure. my image. So well, it always is, right? That's all we've got yeah. really is how yeah. our own experience that we're having. And um, it's, it sounds like it really threatened your status in your tribe. You're in your small town. Yes. Um, you thought you were going to become outcast, it sounds yes. like, because of yes. how 
he was behaving. Uh, so, and did you have that experience of people uh, rejecting you as a result of? Um, I'm just curious if that I was can true. Say, um, mostly, I think that was, it was in my head. But I think, Laura, because I was so bent on this story, um, I think I even created that to some degree, you know. Yeah, um, right. yeah. And I was showing up in a way that didn't, I mean, people didn't really, sometimes they didn't want to be around us because who wants to be around that? So, yeah, yeah I think, but I think you heard what I'm saying, like, it wasn't just yeah. this narrative I was telling myself, it was yeah. something different yeah. going on. So, yeah. yeah, gotcha. Yeah, you're yeah focus on it. And then you were experiencing more of it as, yeah. as I do too. Everything I focus on. Yes. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So it sounds rough. It sounds, yeah. it sounds like you were terrified and you were in a lot of pain most of the time. Yeah. It sounds like I was, yes, I was, um, I was in a lot of pain and the, I mean, the thing that is bonkers about it too, is that like, um, while I had lost pretty much all trace of respect for this man and he knew it. Um, I couldn't, I could not understand why he couldn't love me. I couldn't, um, understand, uh, like it just, that felt so out of, outside of my power. I just felt like, uh, there was nothing I could do to make him love me. Cause he, uh, like, like you said, he told me, you know, he would say, I just, I hate being married to you. <laughs> I just hate it. And, uh, you know, wow. he would daydream about when our son was old enough that we could live these separate lives. And um, he would say, you know, pretty much anything tender that I do for you is more like for a friend. Like I, there's nothing going on. And um, yeah. And then just what I said, like, I, I just, I'm not attracted to you at all. So um, he, he's very, very honest. So I had a lot of good information going, but I had no skills at that time. And so I was, you know, many nights on the floor begging God to like make him see, you know, and, um, and hoping that he would hear me cry and then come and scoop me up. But, uh, uh he, he wasn't interested. He, he was either repulsed or just totally uninterested in my tears. Um, so yeah, huge amount of like net around that rejection. Um, and yet powerless to do anything about it. Um, so you thought, yeah, yeah you, you did. Yeah. So I thought, right. Right. Yeah. And so, um, and you guys struggled around raising your son also. We did. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I just, I really had a lot of fear that he was damaging my son. Like I was just thinking about the therapy bill in 20 years, you know? And, um, and so I would, um, and interject, uh, constantly, I got in the midst, middle of their relationship and would sometimes physically remove my son while he, they were talking, you know, working something out um, or just would really let my husband know, you know, get in between them physically and, and tell my husband what my son was experiencing and what he needed and all those kinds of things. Um, so there was, yeah, no, no emotional safety for my son in our home. And he, you know, he was afraid because it was loud in our house. And, um, and yet he would also kind of use that, you know, he's, he's four now, but, um, he knew we were not a team. And so that was really, I think, frightening for, I mean, I know it was frightening for him. So, um, yeah, that was really bad. And then the, uh, and one of the other areas I wanted to mention is, um, that, you know, these SFPs kind of like, that's kind of the theme I think for everything, but, uh, so they would just follow me, like, even when we're not with people, when we we're alone, um, so that no topic was safe with us. Um, so like if he needed to just, um, if he wanted to tell me something, an idea he had that was like, obviously outlandish, like what, right. what would it be like to go to the moon or whatever? Yeah. And I have all these alerts, you know, alert going off <laughs> to say, you know, he's irrational, he's crazy, you know? And so I'd be like, I would have to tell him why that was crazy. Or um, like if he needed to unload about someone he had been hurt by or something, my alert that he was um, socially inept or um, he didn't know how to have a relationship that would go off. And so I would start defending the other person and I would, I would probably like try to show him how, why that person did that thing because of probably something he had done, you know? So, mm -hmm. so just to say in no sense was there safety, like when we are apart from people either, um, 
And I felt like um, I felt totally unheard. Uh, He felt totally unheard. I felt like I couldn't share an opinion about the mustard and, um, you know, without a meltdown. And so, and we couldn't even, then then we couldn't pray together and, or anything having to do with God, which is what had brought us together. Um, and I remember him saying, you know, say, do you talk about God and God's like love for all of us? And yet you treat me like crap. You treat me like crap. And I just, yeah, that's just so sad because, um, then it's like, what did we have left at that point? You know? So (laughs) it was just, um, so bad. I became someone I didn't recognize. I became a yeller, Laura, a yeller. I, and I was yelling profanities at God, at whoever, you know, not, not at whoever, but just, uh, like in the, you know, out into the air, um, when I needed to. And I just thought, who, who is this person I'm becoming? Um, so it was ugly. It was ugly. And so you were, you had, previously considered a life of just being single. So were you telling yourself like, Oh my gosh, I just should have stayed single. Yes. Oh, constantly. Because I felt my life diminishing my, this, um, life that I had thought about, uh, like, yeah, serving God, loving people. It was like, because of this decision that was impossible now. And so, yeah, total regret, constant regret. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds excruciating. What else did you do to try to fix the marriage? Um, in the battle days, what did yeah. I do? Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's so interesting, Laura, because I tried so many things that were um, right. It's like they were in the right direction, but, um, and I've, you know, I've, had a relationship with God since I was young and I would work with God on these changes that I wanted to make. And yet nothing stuck. I couldn't do it. And so I would try to look at myself. I was trying to look at myself and I did see that there was disrespect and that I was judging this person, my husband. Um, but I, uh, I did not know how to get out of it. I couldn't, I couldn't get out of it. And so I did a lot of, um, inner work. And, uh, I would talk to people, but then I would talk to people trying to get someone to help me look at me. And I mean, everyone just kind of affirmed what, what I saw. Right. Uh, and what right. I was producing actually, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And what you were, um, you're, you were publicizing in a way yeah. too, right? Like we're yes. kind of our husband's publicists. Yeah. Uh, so they start to think other people start to think what we share about them. Uh, yeah, it's true. Definitely. So, yeah. And I, I, and we did, we, I think we did two counseling, um, appointments <laughs> and he, and I was so hopeful. Cause I was like, of course I was like, she's going to tell him, you know, she's going to tell him. Yeah. And, um, and she even had a private call with me one time and was like, um, you know, basically like he's the problem, you know? And, um, and so I was like, okay, she's going to tell him he's the problem. <laughs> and then he just was like, I can't, that makes me feel worse about our marriage. Like I can't do this. And I was like, what, you know, so that felt, uh, really hopeless. Um, I would try to get him to talk to people, you know? Yeah. 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 No, just, and you, uh, you said mentioned his narcissistic tendencies. So it was, you had like a diagnosis for him or yeah. Did yeah. You take a quiz I mean, online or was that more like just you read things and I read things. Or, yeah. Okay. And I had one of my friends confirm them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I love that because it's what we do. Right. This is, yeah. Yeah. And, so. and it, I think it comes out of wanting to figure out how to solve. Right. So if I know yes. what the problem is, then we can solve it. Yes. I think so. Hmm. I Maybe. think so. Or just something, I think something comforting about knowing I'm not crazy, you know? Yes. Hey, yeah. He is a narcissist. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is, um, it sounds very dark. It sounds, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so what happened? Well, <laughs> we moved to Guatemala. That's what happened. And, um, <laughs> and it was, uh, the moment when something started changing was when we had been here about three months. So we're learning the language and we don't have any friends and we're, we're at the bottom of our, if we had resources for 
dealing with stuff before we, they were gone. And so we were working with youth here um, and we live in a very poor area. So there's just a lot of suffering. It's in your face, like all the time. And um, I, he would like tell the youth, like warn them about marriage, you know, just like I would hear him. I could hear him like warning them. And I'm like, okay, so one night, this is, this is what happened. One night I was just laying in bed praying before sleep. And I just said, God, we're making, we're actually making the situation here worse. Like our presence here makes it worse. So if you want to do anything with our lives, you have to show us the next step because this isn't working. It's not going to work. And so, um, so naturally right after I finished my prayer, I started Googling. (laughs) 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 But Laura, I really (laughs) believe that God met me in that Google search. And what I, um, I, I typed, uh, my, my husband isn't attracted to me at all. I typed that in and there you popped up this beautiful person. And, um, that was it. I, uh, I just knew, I knew that was it (laughs) from that first article. So yeah, that's how things started changing. Started listening to the podcast and what did you know in that moment? Like what switched for you? Um, well, you didn't give me a workout plan. You uh, convicted me. And, um, I had always, I, I, all I wanted was to be the kind of person that God had made me to be a good person, you know? Uh, and so I think when you, um, gave me hope that, that actually the situation was not at all what I, what I thought, you know, all the, the problem wasn't what I thought it was. Um, and I, and I wasn't powerless. Then I just, I just was your question. What did I know? Yeah. Like what switched that made you, what, what's the difference between the before and after yeah. in, in your head? Like yeah, <clears throat> you, you knew something that, that you didn't know before. It sounds like. Yeah. It was just that, that conviction that, um, that like of my behavior and my contribution. And I wanted, that's what I wanted to know all along, actually. Um, was, yeah. Was how to, I wanted how to know to, how, how to, how to, uh, well, I wanted someone to tell me what I could do. And, and I also knew I had become a person that I didn't want to be. So there you were giving it to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I hope it didn't hurt too much. But yeah, it probably no, did. It was, good. It was so good. <laughs> it was good. Okay. Yeah. Good. No, good. I was, I was not hurt. I was just eating it up. I was, yeah. Wow. And so what did you start to do differently than what you had been doing? Yeah. Well, I started with some big apologies. Um, just really looking back over the five years and, um, taking responsibility for, um, all the things he'd always told me, you know, and, um, but actually that backfired pretty bad. He got really, (laughs) he got so mad. And he said, he was like, I can't believe it. I, you know, I've told you this for five years and then some woman on some (laughs) podcast tells you, and now you're going to change. So he got really mad. Um, and then he, he got quiet for about two weeks. And, um, and so I think that the first real skill other than the apology was that I had duct tape. So he got quiet and I got quiet and it was really quiet. <laughs> and it was really but quiet. Yeah. I didn't really care because there was peace. And I was like, I have some energy for the rest of life. And, um, and so, yeah, that's what happened first. And then after a couple of weeks, we were sitting at lunch and, um, he said, he just started crying, Laura. He started crying, this big old six foot five German man. And he said, I can't believe this. I, I don't want to have hope for this change because I don't want to get hurt. And um, <laughs> yeah, and, but and yet somehow, and I, I just listened to him and, and I just somehow knew, okay, it's going to be okay. <laughs> Something, it's going to be okay, I think. And so, um, yeah, so that was one of the first first things I did. So he was so vulnerable with you. Yeah. In that moment. And, um, yeah. And you felt, uh, more hope. It sounds like from having, yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. I felt, well, okay. I, I remember now I felt hope. And there was also, this is the first time that I had issued an apology, um, and kept it all on my side of the street. And so there was a bit of, uh, I was a bit terrified that he was going to think actually it had been all my fault all along. 
Um, but I just stuck with it. And, um, and so, yeah, then after that, after he cried that day, then, um, I started to experiment more and, um, and then I, after two weeks, I started seeing profound changes, like huge changes. Like what? Um, well, okay. Let me tell you some more things that I was doing. And then, and then I think that'll lead me into what happened. But, Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, um, one of the biggest ones was, and you say this in different words, Laura, but kind of based on this idea that my sadness wouldn't change the situation, but my, my happiness would. And I was terrified of being happy because I thought that wouldn't, then he wouldn't have the information he needed to be able to change. Right. So, um, so, and I thought, you know, that if he was doing all those things he was doing, I couldn't, I couldn't be happy. So, um, this idea that I could, um, well, the idea that I had been, um, basing all of my mood and my contentment, my peace on factors outside of my control was totally new. Like, I just didn't know that. And then, um, and then when you invited me or one of the other coaches to take back responsibility and that I could do that, I mean, it was, I was so excited and I did that. I, I just did that. And, um, and so I started to be happier and, um, lighter and, uh, that was just so liberating. Um, and then I would do that by just asking those questions. How do I feel and what do I want? And so everything that before felt so subconscious, like I'm frazzled or I'm anxious. Well, it just felt like that before that was a matter of fact, like that just was, it was just happening to me. And now it was like, everything was, I could slow down and say, okay, what, what's really going on? What's the thought? So I work on an SFP first um, and, or, or just figure out what the fear was going on. And then I would just say, how do I feel? Well, I feel I like, I want to lay down for 15 minutes or whatever. And then, or I, I feel, I feel tired. And then what I want, I want to lay down. And so just starting to do that every time the anxiety would come up, um, that was a crazy shift for me and for Samuel. I think he was like, who is this person who, you know, isn't this needy kind of moody lady. So, so that was huge. Um, he saw you like yeah. smiling more or yeah. laughing. Smiling more. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> like I wasn't complaining nearly as much because the duct tape, like you say, I was just like, oh my goodness. I think 98% of the words coming out of my mouth are just either complaining or I'm gossiping or I'm just throwing my stress out into the wind, you know? <laughs> and so that, all that together, I think he was just able to take a deep breath, you know, and um, that started changing the atmosphere a lot. Um, yeah. Wow. And I, um, I worked a lot with, um, with, well, I guess one of the other big changes was how I feel like you taught me how to be self-controlled. <laughs> And, and of course that's something that I felt like I had worked on my whole like adult lives, but I, I had no idea how to do that. And, um, you know, you, you kind of laugh about the common relational wisdom of the day, just like throwing out, you know, however you're feeling in the heat of the moment, we have no resources, like un, unfiltered and, um, somehow that's like emotional safety or that's vulnerability. Like that's, um, and I had done that for five years. You know, that, that was what I, I was like, I got to do this. If he doesn't know me, then I feel like he didn't, we didn't know each other if we weren't able to do that or something. If you were able to just like complain in the moment, you mean like, um, to complain or, or, um, you know, just to be, to, to express my needs and, um, what I want and, or just my stresses or, um, so I just didn't filter any of my words, I guess. Um, and I felt like I'd gotten that advice. You that's know, right. Yeah. You were justified. Cause that's what everyone says you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. Just and be honest. Husband, right? My husband would say, I want us to get to the place where we can just say whatever's on our mind and yeah. you know, that'll, th- that'll be good and it'll clear the air. And so, so that's what we did. And, um, after five, you know, five years of using that, what it's like a lack of skill, actually. It's a lack of skill. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and and yes, it, it, it never made me feel better after unloading all of that. And it, it always pushed him away, sometimes for days. 
And it made him do more of the thing I didn't want and less of the thing I wanted. And so I don't know why I didn't pick up on that earlier, but I didn't. Um, and but even so, if you had, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know what to do different because that's what everybody yeah, that's says right. you're supposed to do, right? That's right. Is, yeah. Even so. if I'd had duct tape, then it would have been all inside, right? This kind of proves that it was his fault, yeah, did, right? right? Because it wasn't working and everyone said, that's what you should do. So yes, proves that's it. right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, um, and so I have now no attachment to sharing unfiltered thoughts with my husband. I mean, like if I want to talk about a bird that flew past the window, I'm going to do that. But just like anything that matters, um, I, I want to think about it. And, um, that's not because we don't have emotional safety. That's because we do. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to nourish it and, um, and I know how to grow it now. And so, um, so I just get really clear on my, on my desires, on my thoughts, like you say, Laura, and, um, I know now that he wants to help me. He wants to put me at ease. He wants to make me happy, you know, like, like we all say, and, um, but he can't sift through a storm cloud of <laughs> different conflicting thoughts and emotions and, um, all that, especially if it has, you know, criticism and, uh, critique in there, uh, to get to my desire. He can't, if I can't sift through it, how is he going to be able to sift through it? So I just do that before do that before. And it goes so much, it's smooth. It's, it's usually smooth, like butter. Like we can talk about anything and it's just safe. And it still baffles me at the end of a long and intimate conversation that there we are safe and sound. Everybody's feeling known and heard. And I mean, <laughs> I just couldn't have been that easy all along. Um, yeah, that's really wow. amazing. <laughs> so. It's amazing. So you're still kind of kind of speechless about it and I, and I get yeah. it because I remember also being similarly amazed and confounded and just um uh kind of mad that I didn't know sooner <laughs> right like yeah. look, how, yes. how is this so hard to for someone else to to pass on uh, yeah yes. I didn't get it, how great. that was so obscured yeah. yeah yeah and so and so your husband would start to say things uh, that had triggered you in the past mm -hmm. still probably, right? Was that mm -hmm. going on? And how would you yeah. handle that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think um, that all had, that had a lot to do with these SFPs too, but also just this, um, that I didn't realize it was okay to disagree and still listen and just, just give someone space to be in their process, their own process. And, and so when you, when you gave me that, uh, like you told me that was okay. Um, then, then I was just fine. And I could just say to myself during the conversation, that's a good man. And I'm so oh. glad he can figure out his own relationships and, um, everything's going to be fine. I started using a lot, this, um, Julian of Norwich, you know, that she says like, all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. And I can just listen to him talk about anything. It's all okay. And you know what? It's amazing. Now that I don't get in there and come with the defense uh, and the, you know, firing squad, um, he, he comes around. He, he always, almost always says, but you know what? That person, they're really struggling. And that's probably why they did that. And I, I didn't, I had no idea that I was actually, um, I was short cutting, short circuiting his process. And um, he is a good man. And so, yeah, the same with parenting, the same with his relationship with my parents, all of that. I was making the situation worse by my control and my fear. And now I would say he has a great relationship with my parents, for example, with my son, an incredible relationship with my son. Really? Um, yes. Yes. Well, let's hear about that. Cause that, that didn't seem like it was going that well before. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, I mean, a lot of it has been my perspective changing. Um, and so I just really appreciated people like Coach Dar saying like, you know, he's going to do things differently. Like he's a man and he, you don't maybe know how to be a father, maybe. Oh. <laughs> and, um, and so, and so just to have that shift of like, oh, my perspective is not necessarily the truth. And, um, you know, and then. Um, that allows him the space to, 
to kind of feel the full weight of his um of his sternness i think and then he they always come back together like but i see now that my son needs that in his life he needs that um fatherly order and um he needs me too with this big compassionate heart but if it was just me probably be a mess like he'd definitely be in therapy you know yeah Yeah, (laughs) so so they were just laying beside each other this morning they had a big loud ruckus together my son was crying and then I just heard my husband say um he he, I heard my son say it was my fault and it, it was my fault and my husband said no you know if you're having a hard time being a son it's probably because I'm having a hard time being a father and so we're just figuring it out together. <laughs> and I thought, oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so moving. yeah. So, oh, yeah. and it's funny because I was just thinking your humility is astounding to me. You know, it's, it's very moving how like these things you're saying, like I, you started out with apologizing. That's very humble. And you um, kind of got clear, like, oh, I, I'm not going to be a good father. I'm I'm not his mm-hmm. father, and and his mm-hmm. his son needs his father, and um, and now I really hear this humility sort of spreading in your family. Yes, yes, Laura. And it sounds like you did that. That's my conclusion from hearing the story to hear, yeah. right? That this is a culture you brought to your family. Yes, uh, that everyone's embraced. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I can't believe the the responsibility I have in there or the power I have in the area of um, uh, the culture of the home. And it's true for gratitude. My husband really never said thank you before. He never learned to apologize with his family. He apologizes, apologizes to me all the time now. You're and kidding. if I say ouch, he's like, oh, I didn't want to hurt you, you know? And I mean, it's just it's almost dumb. Like, (laughs) and yeah, but definitely the humility. Um, so yeah, I think it's such a great lesson to be the change you want to see. Right. Um, cause I, I just see that being mirrored in my son and my husband. So yeah, it's huge. Yeah, that is huge. And, and how do you think, it's impacted your son that uh, you have peace and all this humility and apologizing Mm. going on uh, in your family. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I don't know if I could point to like behavior differences in him. Like he's, he's a good kid, but, but I guess I just think about long-term how it, I mean, It just will. The story is so different now for him. And um, and the other day he did say to me, Mama, you and Papa don't fight now. He's he's four. He's four. Yeah, he definitely um, he definitely knows that there's a huge difference. Um, But and I I just see a huge difference in his relationship with my husband. So um, so what's your what is your marriage like now? How would you describe it? Yeah. Um, well, I would say um, it's very, it's very safe. It's very supportive. Um, I would say I feel heard and I feel, um, I feel desired. Um, I feel like, yeah, that, that we are walking together, supporting one another in this life that, um, that we want to be living. And, um, yeah, I told a group of friends the other day, actually back in the States on the phone, I just said, we, we never argue. We just don't argue. And they were like, you guys, uh, we were on zoom. <laughs> they were like, really? So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's very, it's like a different, it is, it's a different marriage. It's a different, different marriage. So Wow. You made your friend's heads explode. Yeah. I tell them you don't argue. So, and you mentioned in the beginning, there really wasn't love, right? There mm-hmm. wasn't romantic love. Yeah. So how, how is it now? I think I would say now I would definitely say I love this man. 
And I definitely would say that I feel romantic with him. <laughs> and um, I, I think as far as like um, our intimate life goes, like there's, there's so much safety there now. Um, there's so much safety, there's so much joy. And so, yeah, I mean, I think Laura, you know, you say, I've heard you say, um, reality is like a squishy kind of thing. Does that sound like you or um, something like that? And I, I feel the same way about romance and love, um, that, you know, like I do love him and, uh, and I feel that too. And if I got all in my head about that and started comparing myself and, um, I guess I could feel something else, but I don't want to, you know, right, right. so, so yeah, you're, choosing, you're choosing affection and love yeah. and, uh, romance. Yeah. And you're in your focus. You're focusing your mind very wisely. Yeah. And that is turning out to be your experience. Yeah. And I think yeah. I just have, um, I'm just not in a hurry. I think I see these, these signs of something really new developing in that area. And I'm just not worried about it. And um, actually, my husband said the other day, he was like, he, he said something like, um, we have something really, um, I mean, he, he'll just put it out there like that, like really intimate going on. But uh, I think there's more. I think there's more we could have. And, and so I think that's where I am. You know, I'm just not, uh, I'm very thankful to be in this marriage. And, and I'm just knowing that the best is yet to come. So, wow. So you're yeah. excited to hear that. Not, that didn't sound like a criticism to you. It just sounded like vision for your future. Yes, it did. With the skills it did. If I had heard that before, it would have been a different story, but yeah, with the skills, I, I was excited. Yeah. Wow. That, that yeah. is exciting. So, and, and you feel that he loves you. It sounds like yes. you feel desired. Yes, I do. I do. And actually, I know I actually, um, you know, before when we were just friends and before I started all the fear and all the controlling, um, he did love me like he was he was kind of crazy about me. (laughs) And so um, it just started so early on with my control and everything that that's um, we didn't have very much of that. But um, so anyway, yeah, I think that's there. And I wanted to share. Uh, because I started by sharing that, you know, he, well, no, the, the moment of shift when he, sh- he was uh, warning the youth here about yes. marriage. Okay. And then the, uh, there was this moment a few months ago uh, when I was laying in bed and he thought I was asleep. And we had some, this couple over, this young couple, and they were staying up late talking to him. Sounds like he's good at relationships, I guess. And um, they, <laughs> guess they were sharing his, their feelings. And You weren't um, even there to run interference no, and make sure I he mean, was saying the wrong things. That's yeah. so weird. Okay. How did they do that without me? But, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, so um, yeah, I just heard him. So they're living together and considering marriage. And um, he, I heard him say, you know what? I would actually really love to marry Sage all over again. And he said, the bonds of marriage have been so good for me. And so I thought, wow, he went from discouraging, basically discouraging youth here um, about marriage to saying, this can be something so good, so good. And so I was like, (laughs) I could not believe it. No, that must have melted you. You must have felt like a million bucks hearing that he wants to marry you all over again. What yes. a, that's incredible high compliment after what you've described. It was about five years of absolute um, pain and suffering for both of you. Yes. And yeah. that's erased now. That's gone. Yeah. It's yeah. over. That's right. That's, it's over. It's yeah. over, Laura. And wow. that's not to say um, that it, that's not to say that, well, I'm so glad I'm a work in progress. Like, sure. Uh, I, I wanted to be clear on this interview that we are not, um, it's not like uh, rainbows and butterflies forever. You know, it's not, um, <laughs> that's not life to me, but um, just that I, I know what to do now and that we're on a team now. Um, and so like, for example, this is really interesting. The other night, um, 
I, I was triggered um, for the first time in months around like rejection and um, being unloved. And, um, and I was like, whoa, this is coming with the same force as it always did. And, you know, before I would have like, um, like just put myself around him, like in the room, just like kind of hovering, needing him to fix me, needing him to make me okay. I would maybe cry. I would, you know, apologize and hope for an apology from him, all these things. Um, and then I would like, maybe just go cry myself to sleep or something like that. Um, and, and then this time all those feelings came up, but I knew exactly what to do. And I just took responsibility. I just went in and said, Hey, that was because I had, what I had done was something very controlling and ungrateful. And so I just went in and said, Hey, that was totally like the way this evening ended because we were in this like super connected, deep talk. And then I threw this one line in there and it was, I know like it was a knife. And, um, and so I just said the way this evening ended, I take total responsibility for that. Instead of thinking I'm a victim, he doesn't love me. Um, all those things. So I just said, that was me. And I apologize for being disrespectful for doing that. And then um, I knew he needed space. That was what he needed. It was going to be fine. So I just left him. And then I was the only one who could bring me down. So I, I just went and got alone. And there were a few expletives that started my prayer. And I got those <laughs> out. <laughs> and then I just talked through the lies and the pain with God. And I, I flipped all of them to see that actually there were lies. And then I had an abundance of evidence for like exactly what I needed to know to go to sleep. And then I went to sleep. And so, um, so I just want to say like, I will, I think I'll always, you know, be triggered, triggered. I will continue to work on, um, expressing desires in a pure way. You know, I, I just want women to know, like, um, it's not like, uh, not real life, like it's real life, but I just know what to do now. And yeah, uh, yeah. you didn't, you didn't become perfect good. from, yeah. uh, you've got some skills, but it doesn't mean you don't make mistakes or the old ways don't seem tempting sometimes. Right. Yes. And yeah. It's the same here. So, yes, but it's a heck of a lot better. Oh, than, it's so yeah. much better. Oh, it's so much better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's almost yeah. like it's an adventure. That's how I would see it now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I love that. Well, what is your, what is your best tip for a woman who is feeling like she's where you were, where her marriage just feels hopeless and painful every day and exhausting. And she wants to know how she can get where you are, where she feels loved and desired. And, um, and she loves her husband. Maybe, maybe she relates to that. She never married because of romantic love, right. That she just, Mm -hmm. uh, she finds herself in this marriage, just thinking it was a huge mistake. Mm. Uh, and now she wants to create what you've created with all this humility and emotional safety and mm. connection. Yes. What's, what's your tip for her? How should she start? Well, um, I think what would have helped me is if I had really known that um, we had everything we needed for a, for a good life together of joy, of love, of peace. There was nothing missing. We, we had what we needed and no one um, was broken beyond no one was repair. broken. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or, or we were both a little broken, you know, yeah, too. Yeah, and, yeah, um, maybe. yeah. And, and that, and then that, um, all, all she needs to do is, is look at herself, take, stay with herself and, and she'll be surprised how everything changes, but just, just stay with herself on the changing. Yeah. No. And the scroll. Yeah. I mean, I love that. And I, I, I know that that's my experience also, but what would you say to somebody who says, but what about him? He's the Mm -hmm. one that really needs to change. Why do I have to do all this work? Yeah. What do you mean? Why me? Yeah. 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 And I, I still feel that some days I can still uh, have that voice creeping in. And um, I think all I would say is um, uh, that's right. He needs to change too. Uh, and the best way for that to happen is for you to change you. <laughs> <laughs> I, love it. I love it. So has your husband changed? Is he different? Yes. 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 Very how, much. Mm-hmm. How is he different? I don't see him as an angry person anymore. 
I, I don't, I don't even feel like he has, um, a, a timber anymore. And I would have said like, that was one of the main, his main things that he couldn't see before. So I, he, I, I don't see him as an angry person. Um, he, he's much more tender with me and kind. He, um, yeah, like the things I said, he's, um, helping me. He, I, I guess I also have just, um, realized things about like, you know, when I started, uh, experimenting with expressing desires, like one week I was like, I gotta be careful with this because things just appear, you know, things are just appearing. It's like having a magic <laughs> wand. <laughs> like, yeah. I didn't really want a dog or whatever, you know, but, um, <laughs> you just said it. And then, Oh no, now yeah. you have a dog. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have a dog. Thank goodness. But, um, but anyway, yeah. So he, he's changed in so, so many ways. I, I guess I'm not being very, I'm not giving the full list right now because I didn't, I have to have things written out before Laura mostly, oh, but, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but yeah, I, I feel like it, he's a different person. That's what he's not. A, like. Is he a narcissist still? No, he's no. not. He, no. Okay. And I can have an opinion and it's okay. And all those kinds of things. But, <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. What would you say to Sage if you could go back in time and tell yourself what you know now? Um. I would just say, um, if you can just trust, if you can just, um, take a deep breath, then, um, you're going to see that this person, this man is, um, one of the greatest gifts you could have ever received for this life (laughs) because, um, just because of who he is, but also because of who he's making me to be. Um, so I think I would just say, it's not a mistake. You know, it's okay. Yeah. Wow. Beautiful. So what seemed like a mistake has turned out to be um, a wonderful gift for you. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And, you know, in this place, Laura, I just, um, I really want to, I mean, I can't say thank you. It just isn't enough. But um, in this place where uh, good marriages, um, commitment in, in our area of um, in our neighborhood, um, healthy relationships are so rare. Um, kids with two parents who love each other and make a safe space. It's, it's so rare. And so, um, that we get to be together with these youth, with these children, with these adults, and that our home is now this place, um, you know, where before I would almost not want to have people in because of the environment that was there. Now it's this place where, um, where, yeah, a place of peace where children who don't have that anywhere else can come. And, um, and our house is full of kids all the time (laughs) and, um, and youth. And so I just want to say thank you so much for, um, for your commitment to your marriage and sharing that with us and the way that that's changing my neighborhood. It's, it's changed, changed me. And now it's changing my neighborhood and, and the world, Laura. So your mission is in full, full swing. <laughs> Fantastic. I love hearing that. Thank you so much. It's super inspiring to hear that you get to be the role model for what's possible for a, a strong family, a marriage that lasts and thrives, especially, um, yeah, to a lot of children that maybe don't get that, don't get to see that anywhere else. Yeah, Um, you get to be that. Uh, Yeah, I just want to congratulate you on fixing your family, Mm. uh, making, uh, 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 giving your son a home court advantage that a lot of kids don't get. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And just being an inspiration to all of us today. Yeah. Thank you so much, Laura. Thanks for having me. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. Relationship advice of uh, the worst relationship advice. Uh, yeah, it's the worst relationship advice of uh, the worst relationship advice of uh, the week. 
And now it's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. And the advice that has me in a tizzy this week was sent to me by a student who writes, I'm such a huge follower of yours, been part of the program for a year now, came across this this morning in my feed. Horrible advice that makes women look like martyrs and losers once we marry. I thought you would get a kick out of reading this horrible advice. And I just feel so seen and so known right now because I am getting a big kick out of this terrible advice. So thanks for the love. And here's uh, the anonymous shout out, my anonymous shout out to you for sending this great contribution. Thank you so much. And the link she sent me is to a post that's titled, is marriage a good choice? Not if you're a woman. And it's about how women suffer so much when they're married in a variety of ways, like uh, taking on more of the household work. And the article goes on to say that, quote, household inequity is a form of abuse with real and long lasting consequences for women's well being. So, pretty much all wives are victims, and we would be better off having never married, according to this. So, there's that perspective. And I can definitely see how seductive this would be if you're feeling depleted, if you haven't had any self-care, if you've worked your fingers to the bone to take care of your kids in your home and your husband, and you just see him sitting on the couch. It's so tempting to go down this road of having someone tell you that you're abused and feeling validated because they said that. That's why you feel so bad because you're being abused. You're a victim. You're living with a couch sitting abuser who leaves you with all the chores and he doesn't do his share. And so it's his fault that your life is so miserable. You can get yourself pretty worked up about that. I remember doing that in the bad old days. And the problem is when I felt like a victim back in the bad old days, And I looked around for a villain and saw my husband there on that couch. I was blaming the wrong person. The reason I was so victimized and exhausted all the time and furious about it was because someone was mistreating me. All right. But that someone turned out to be none other than me. It was me. It didn't seem like it, of course. It seemed really obvious. It was his fault that I was overworked and underappreciated and wasn't getting any help. But now that I get all kinds of help and appreciation and plenty of time to relax and play volleyball and other things that delight me, it's pretty clear that the perpetrator of the crimes against me was me. The solution to my problems was to stop being so miserable. And Coach Kathy gave me a placard once that said, a terrible thing has happened. I've lost my will to suffer, which is hilarious, but that is exactly what happened. I had to be willing to give up my commitment to being miserable by making sure I delighted myself. And I had to spend time laughing and singing and playing because That was actually vital. It was not a luxury that I just could never afford. It was a necessity. And once I spent more time, energy, and money on my happiness, this kind of message about marriage being a bad choice for women, it just didn't resonate anymore. It wasn't tempting at all. My experience is that my marriage has endless benefits for my mental health, my physical well being, my security, my finances, my happiness. It's my soft place to land, to hear how beautiful and wonderful I am and to have doors open for me and tea made for me and the dishes done for me and to dance and to play. It's where I laugh a lot and I get compliments. And I hear from so many students that the same thing happens for them when they get the six intimacy skills and they experience the connection framework. You know, marriage felt hard when they didn't have the right training and skills and same for me. And once I got that training and skills, it became the best thing in the whole world. For that reason, the advice that marriage is not a good choice. If you're a woman is the very, very worst relationship advice I have heard all week. 
listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, I'll share three steps to a more attentive spouse. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that I lost my sunglasses twice this week, but I found them both times on top of my head. <laughs>